I'm Josh Cooperman. This is Convo by Design. And today we inch ever closer to the West Edge Design Fair 2024 edition with everything going on behind the scenes as we prepare a slate of programming to surprise and delight you. I wanted to share a program from the past. As we finalize the roster and get everything solidified, I wanted to share the, the why behind the programming. These panels are crafted to feature game-changing, disrupting creatives and topics that hold up over time. What makes the West Edge stage so special is the thought and effort that goes into creation, ideation of these topics. They've all been carefully crafted, talent curated to speak to these ideas, ideas that should hold up for years to come. The program you're going to hear today was called Craftsmanship in the Digital Age. Here's how it was described in the program. Is craftsmanship a lost art in a world where we increasingly value expediency and accessibility over authenticity and beauty? Join Stephen Gra uh, Gambrell, interior designer and co-founder of Deering Hall, as he leads a discussion with some of the most talented artisans and designers working today. How have our digitally centered lives made us care even more about objects created with passion, skill, and time honored tradition? How do designers create a network of skilled craftspeople and educate their clients about the value of craft? Explore the marketing of bespoke products and how digital tools have made success as an artisan more of a reality than ever before. Featuring Bernard Brucha of MASH Studio, Paul Priven of Zia Priven, Wendy Schwartz of Cuff Home, and Delta Wright of Curated. Think about this for a moment. The program you're about to hear was covering craftsmanship and the value that authenticity holds in made goods. This conversation might as well have taken place this year or in 2020 at the onset of the pandemic when authentic craftsmanship was a must have or in 2018 when every designer at every design event was talking about and discussing how to reach millennials and their desire for fewer but more authentic goods or well now again, at a time when handmade comes at a premium. Again, this was recorded in 2015, live at West Edge, and I'm proud to share this with you again, right after this. I am just incredibly proud of this partnership I've got with Thermosol. They have been presenting partners of Convo by Design going on five years now, and there is a certain amount of pride that comes with saying that the show is presented by the company that is the best in the world at what they do. Thermosol engineers the most exceptional smart shower products and steam shower systems worldwide, full stop. And it's for a few reasons. First of all, they were the first company to design and patent the technology here in the United States dating back to 1958. Thermosol, a US-based manufacturer based in Round Rock, Texas, employs an engineering team that designs tests, and continuously refines the product. Their quality control team tests every single steam generator before it departs the factory. Who else does that? Nobody that I know of. I have the pleasure of working with some world-class designers and architects who tell me, and if you're in the business, you know this, that the idea of luxury has changed, especially when clients want a spa-like bathroom. Steam is mandatory or it's just not considered a, a luxury. And if you want to add steam, you have only one true option, my opinion, and that's Thermosol. Mitch Altman, third generation CEO of this family owned company of 65 years, continues to innovate in the bathroom and shower space through technological marvels, such as intelligent showering systems, sound therapy, aromatherapy, technical interfaces, and so much more. And now Thermosol, the industry leader in steam bath equipment and technology since 1958, as I mentioned, is enhancing its already stellar family of products with the new indoor and outdoor luxury saunas available in three designs. The configurations are absolutely amazing, and you should probably go check them out. 
indoor and outdoor options. It's amazing. You really do need to check them out. Uh, go to thermosol.com or at thermosol on the socials. Hi, I'm Stephen Gambrell, and I'm a co-founder of, of Deering Hall. Um, I'm located, uh, we're located in New York City. Um, I also have an interior design firm. We do architecture and interior design. And um, the reason I mention that is because um, I like things that kind of evolve organically. And um, it was really just a very simple process of, of, of saying, you know, it's, it's interesting that interior designers and architects, they sit there in this big office full of creative people, and they have these great proper projects that, that they're afforded. Uh, so you can, you know, choose what to put in them. And then you have a bunch of great clients who want beautiful things. And uh, you look around and you think there's certainly plenty of interior designers and architects besides myself creating beautiful things. And in fact, Los Angeles is a place that I've always found sort of intriguing because uh, maybe it's because of the amount of space you have, but the, the, you, you create a lot of things here. And I said to, uh, to Peter Salek, uh, my partner, um, you know, it's so fascinating, but if, if I could get access to other people's um, great designs, then um, imagine how great that would be. So for example, if I wanted to find a lacquered tray, you know, where, do I, where, where does one go? I mean, what, what would you do, really? And you'd kind of, maybe you'd Google lacquered tray, and, and obviously there's spectacular websites for um, vintage, so maybe you'd come up with a vintage lacquered tray. But how, how do you get access to unique content? And that was really what it was. And it was actually kind of fascinating to me that that didn't exist in some ways, because, <clears throat> unique content. I mean, let even, uh, this is a project of mine, but even light fixtures that I'm doing for um, uh, Urban Electric, um, there, I, you know, the, I designed what I needed, so that was easy. I designed what I couldn't find in the marketplace. But then, here's some of the light fixtures. So then, how does one get access to that kind of stuff? How would another designer know to go to Urban Electric? So it was kind of a great opportunity to put together um, design firms that create terrific product and then of course the same thing goes with craftsmen there could be craftsmen you find at a fair uh, or craftsmen that are extremely um, advanced and have uh, very curated collections but you look at it and you think it's all out there but how do we find it and um, I think we should just uh, introduce everybody here and they can talk about what they what they do towards this whole process of creating unique content Ladies first. Yes. Oh, thanks. Hi, I'm Delta Wright of Curated. We're in New York and Los Angeles. We're an interior design serve, full service interior design firm. I'm Wendy Schwartz of Cuff Home. We're also here in Los Angeles and on the East Coast in New York. Um, and we do interior design and create products. Hi, I'm Bernard with MASH Studios. Uh, we are a furniture design studio and a furniture manufacturer. And I'm Paul Priven from Zia Priven. I'm one of the co-founders, and we design and manufacture custom lighting. And we're exhibiting here. And we're also on Daring Hall. So, I, I, you know, actually, I, I think I'm going to start with you. So, so did you create content, a product, because you couldn't find it elsewhere, or was it just a, something you were interested in? That's a great question. It's a little of everything. Um, we created it initially out of need. That was, that was in, what inspired our very first pieces 15 years ago. Uh, we started with Petit Chandler's. Our company's grown and um, evolved into a much different company than it was. But yeah, initially it was created out of need. And that's how we did it. My, my wife, who's also my partner and co-founder, was a set decorator. And she found a, a niche for petite chandeliers, and that's how we started. So that's why it began. And then how did people initially find you? Or how, how did people find you over the years? Trade shows. Trade shows were actually the, the first and the most uh, valuable asset to us because you get to be in front of anywhere from five to 35,000 people. And we started in New York mostly, and we did a variety of trade shows out there, and now obviously West Edge. And did you, after the trade shows, did, did you find that individual smaller companies were repping you, at a smaller uh, showroom in, in uh, Los Angeles or New York or elsewhere? Yeah, for our product specifically, we have uh, nine showrooms right now, 10 showrooms across the US and Canada, and it did develop into uh, acquiring press, getting published, meeting more and more designers and architects, growing that way. And it was really an organic way that we grew, uh, bit by bit. And over time, that's how it evolved, yes. Right. And Bernard, did you have the same experience? Uh, well, we're a, l a little different in that. So my, I started off as a, a, a just straight design. So uh, I came out of school and I had all these great ideas and I wanted to uh, share 
share our designs with, uh, with everyone. So I, I went and I tried to approach different manufacturers. And I, I, I couldn't find anybody to produce our, our product. So that's, that's how we got our start is we said, all right, well, if, if, if nobody else is going to do this, let's slowly build and build. Uh, and, and now we've got our, our own production facility uh, down in Orange County, and uh, we've got about 50 craftsmen that are making our products. And Wendy, do you, how much do you produce in terms of? Um, actually, we're also on Daring Hall, and I would say that that's one of the main places we're selling our product. We sort of got into the product um, through interior design, of course, always designing custom pieces for clients and everything, but then we participated in the show house. And I really, we both really used that as an opportunity to launch Cuff Home products um, and have since kind of been adding to it as time permits, but I love that part of it and I love finding local artists to make our, our, our pieces and I think kind of what really sets our pieces apart is that artisanship um, that I, we approach our product design with a very artful sculptural approach that sets it apart from kind of all those other products that you can just buy. Do you think that the exposure um, on Deering Hall or elsewhere, that are people starting to really relate to the craftsmanship part of it? Um, Typically, I think that that's... they know to go to Daring Hall when they're looking for something that's created by a designer. Right. You know, something special. Um, yeah, I mean, I know that that's where I go when I'm looking for something that's new versus vintage. You know, vintage, maybe you go to First Dibs or you go wherever. Right. But when I'm looking for something new by, you know, designers like you or whoever, Daring Hall is the first place I go. So then do you, how do you feel about, how's the portfolio? What I like about, um, I think what I like about the whole way it's laid out uh, for you, for me, is that your portfolio is on there. So right. I think people start to see things um, in context, which Correct. is helpful because, you know, in the old days, I think you saw things in catalogs and they weren't in context. Uh, I guess that's why, you know, fashion likes models. But the, uh, you know, it seems helpful to see it in context. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what's most helpful is the accessibility. Period, you know, that you have access to wherever it is, you have access in one place. You know, and for me, I'm a mom, I'm busy, I work too. The access is what makes it amazing. It makes me, I'm able to do my job. All right. And it's all produced here? Uh, it's all produced here. Nice. I want to add something to that. Of course. Deering Hall is also really well curated. And I think that's another thing that appeals to companies like us. And that's part of the reason that I think we, we find an appeal in that as well. Not just to the designer, but also to the vendor, the, the company that's manufacturing some of the products. So being involved in a site that has a well-curated uh, inventory, right. as it were, is You is mean edited. As well. Well right. edited. You mean it's well-edited. Well-edited. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Curated is your word. Well, I didn't, I didn't mean it like that. I just mean <laughs> no, I that's know. what we're looking for, that you've done the work for us. You're bringing us stuff that's already edited. Exactly. It's already you know, been selected for us. So, we so what, can who's, the, who's the buyer, mostly? For? When, from things that you're selling online, who, who's, the, who's the typical buyer? Is it a designer? Is it, a, is it an individual? Is it a, a wealthy person who doesn't have an interior designer? Um, well, I, uh, l let me just start by saying I love the topic of craftsmanship. Um, my undergraduate degree is in craft, actually. That's what it says on the diploma of, of fine arts, um, glass and ceramics. Mm -hmm. And then my master's degree in interior design. So for me, um, craftsmanship and curating is really about um, coming from the place of being an artist and approaching interior design as an art form. And every aspect of what we do is touched by artisans. And the idea of developing unique products, so like everyone here is doing, and then you know, knowing that they've already done the work, they've already found the artisan, they've already developed a piece that's unique that we can purchase on Daring Hall. You've already done the work, we know we can go there and find it. Um, that's what we're, as interior designers, that's what we're bringing to our clients. So it's the entire process of being an artisan and being a craftsperson, even as an interior designer. How, how, do, you, how do you think that you, how, how do you tell your story the best? For, I think that when you buy, some, when somebody is interested in something that's highly crafted or unique content, that, I mean, I intuitively want that, but right. I think sometimes it's difficult to get clients to understand the value. Typically, mm -hmm. they're potentially more expensive, but also um, people are busy. Yeah. And so telling the story, I always think is a little, it's hard to find, I, I'm sad sometimes when we yeah. create something amazing and there's no time for the client to actually hear the story of the guy who did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you have to make it very much about the client. And we actually selected the name Curated 10 years ago. It comes from my background in the arts and, and museum design. My, my thesis was in exhibition design. So for me, Curated was more of a museum word when we selected it many years ago. Um, 
But the way we sell it to our clients is that we're telling a story that's theirs. It's unique to them. So because they care about the story that we're writing for them through their visual environment, they, they want to know what we're putting in it. And we usually start with a collection that already belongs to them, even if it's something that we might not be as interested in for our own reasons, but it becomes important to the project because it's important to our client. And then, then all of our products can come from there. And they're, they're naturally interested, invested. Absolutely. So then, and when you create content, product, actual pieces, do you sometimes not want them to be more than a one-off? Well, yeah, we're pretty, that, you know, that's painful. Well, copying is painful to me. Mm -hmm. um, so you prefer we ha It's difficult because our clients come with ideas and they have, they've seen things in pictures and the internet has certainly made that a very difficult thing to deal with and even from an ethical standpoint in our in-house, in our studio to riff on things without feeling like we're copying. And um, of course we want everything we make to be one of a kind, but that's not realistic. So we also are in business and we're part of a larger industry and business and we want to take the efforts that we've invested and then make it available to more people. So, so you would rather expose it, it depends. the, you'd rather clients, expose the quality of craftsmanship probably. Mm -hmm. And certain clients do want things to be one of a kind, and that's very important, and that's part of the fun of the process for us, that we get to make something that truly is unique and right. one of a kind. Wendy? Which part of the question? Well, I mean, do you, do you, yeah. uh, how, do you, do, how do you typically try to market the idea of a highly crafted piece that potentially is either going to take longer or cost more, or there's something probably more difficult about selling I, you it know, than... I, don't, I honestly don't think we have to tell a story for that. I think when a client sees that compared to pr product that actually isn't quality, mm -hmm. that that speaks for itself. So we, we definitely have clients that mix highs and lows. Mm -hmm. And believe me, when those lows come, they're usually disappointed. You know, when those show up and they don't look exactly the way they look on the online, yeah. you know. Um, mm -hmm. and, they're, they're, they speak for themselves. They fall apart quickly. You know, they just they speak for themselves. So I think, as I as I was telling you guys earlier, we have a client. We're gonna, I'm going to go see later today who is disappointed because of these sofas that we kind of went a little bit lower end on. You know, a little look for less. And now compared to the rest of the stuff in her house, she sees it. She what, sees the did difference. You, was it one of your designs that you changed the manufacturer? Uh, no, no, no. It was it was something we bought from another oh, supplier, oh. Um, and and so that compared to some of the other products we bought, whether they're our own or from you know Urban Electric Company or from, I think it's BDW. What is it? The they mm -hmm. um, on the East Coast some beautiful stools. She notices the craftsmanship in those, and when you look at it compared to the things made in China, yeah. I mean mm -hmm. you don't really have to tell a story. No, we even did a <laughs> we did a, a model room for a. A condo that I designed the mm -hmm. fittings and um, they didn't have the budget to do the typical upholstery but I wanted it to be a room that I did um, so that it spoke the right language for what I was trying mm -hmm. to say and so we sent all my drawings to this really inexpensive upholsterer mm -hmm. and it to was have just, him knock off your stuff yeah to basically <laughs> knock off our stuff and um, I every time I go in there I'm like oh because it's like the, the angle's not quite uh -huh. right and the details mm -hmm. aren't quite right I mean and it, it probably doesn't sit quite comfortable no comfortable, but like no one know? probably will ever sit in it because yeah. it's sort of a showroom but still yeah. you look at it across the room and you're like oh so um, that's when you really realize that it's all about quality it's all about the details I think that the idea of time is the thing that's hardest for clients um, because time is money. I think it's not even the price tag anymore. They want something unique. They want something handcrafted, perhaps, something that's special to them. But to really get something right, it does take time. There's a lot of study and development that goes in. To me, that's what craftsmanship is about. It's about study and time and attention and detail and being thoughtful about your work and what you're even proposing. And it's hard to get people to be patient these days, especially when they can see a picture and think they should just be able to click a button and buy it. You know? right. You're listening to Craftsmanship in the Digital Age from the West Edge Design Fair in 2015. We'll be right back. Man, I, I love this. I, I have a new sponsor partner on the show that I want to introduce you to if you're not already familiar with them. If you are a specifying designer architect, landscape architect, or savvy design enthusiast, if you have heard about the quiet luxury movement, this idea of crafting a lifestyle around understated elegance, simplicity, and sophistication, there's more to it than that. And I will add uncomplicated living. Isn't that what we all strive for? I'm, I am extremely happy. I'm really thrilled to 
share a company that embodies all of this, utilizing proprietary technology and a focus on sustainability in their stunningly beautiful products. It's TimberTech. TimberTech is the premium decking company delivering multi-tonal color blending and natural wood textures in a product that is virtually indistinguishable from a natural wood product. What does this mean? It means it's everything wood should be, a beautiful look that blends seamlessly with a well-designed space, providing years of enjoyment and performs the way you want it to. No splintering, fading, peeling, cracking, or rotting. I I had a wood deck uh, at our Manhattan Beach home, and I got to tell you, it was exasperating every year, doing the random board flip, taking out nails, resetting them, restaining them. It was a complete pain. It was complicated, and I didn't look forward to it. I wish I had TimberTech because TimberTech is not only uncomplicated, it's beautiful. It comes in over 20 finish options and nine collections, and 85% of the material is recycled. This is premium decking for your next project. Learn more and specify it for your next design project, TimberTech, on the socials, or TimberTech.com, where you can find a retailer near you, as well as a number of tools to create, design, order samples, and get the expert help you may need. TimberTech is uncomplicated luxury and performs. It's your choice for your next deck project. Design Hardware's newly remodeled showroom is where you will find a gallery-style space with a thoughtful display of products, purposefully positioned to allow unbridled exploration and discovery. High-end faucets, luxury tile, natural stone, wood floors, and bespoke hardware selections are presented in a holistic manner, strategically arranged to stimulate creativity and transition your vision from the conceptual stage to a fully realized space. Conveniently located, free parking available, stop by to find your inspiration, collect samples, get expert advice, and tackle everything on your shopping list all in one place. Visit them online at designhardware.com or in the real world, 6053 West 3rd Street in Los Angeles. I agree with that. I wanted to add something to that. You know, it's interesting because we all have a different approach, but, you know, Philippe Stark even said that every house should have a piece of Ikea in it, which isn't necessarily something I agree with, but I get his point and that there is, there has to be space for lower end or less expensive or Mm -hmm. functional items as well as the things that we're all doing. And I I find it interesting because it is hard to tell a story. It's very, for us, I find it hard. Yeah, you can look at the quality and the craftsmanship and someone might see it when they're standing in front of it, but over the phone or in a photo, Mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily translate. And what has given us an advantage in doing the trade shows is the two of us are there and we're talking to them and we can explain them. You can touch something when, when someone has it in their hand and it's tactile, you can feel the thickness of the glass or the weight of the brass, whatever it is, it speaks volumes, I think. And so, yeah, I mean, on one hand, people don't want to spend on certain items, but in the, you know, because in the last five years, the economy took a turn. And now that things are picking back up, I agree. Do, you, do people like to customize your pieces Everything. mostly? So they don't... They Nearly be- 100% of our pieces mm-hmm. are custom. Everything we do is made to order and to spec. Was that your plan, or did Absolutely. they just get that idea and then? Because no, I our sometimes plan. I kind of get excited about someone and then try to get them to customize things for me, and they don't want to. They just oh, no. you know they can't do it. But that, that's how we designed it. Basically, you we, were planning. That. We designed a line of lighting, and we continue to come out with new products and new designs and whatnot. And then every single one is fully customizable: sizes, shapes, finishes, materials, anything. And then we can also work from drawings. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's an advantage as well, being able to modify. So do you think that the, expo- uh, the kind of this new world of uh, even big box stores creating, you know, relatively nice um, visual things, um, does that help the idea of craftsmanship and kind of custom, uh, kind of high couture pieces like yours? Um, I, would, I would actually say that it would help. I think that overall it helps because I think it gives a greater amount of people a better awareness of design. I think if you look at the average consumer today, I think they're a lot more savvy than they were 10 years ago. I think with, with HGTV and Fine Living and all the shows that are out there, between do-it-yourselfers, people that dabble in design, and the internet, and the way that all of us have a much greater exposure, potential exposure than we ever have, 
I think people are really, they're, it's just more accessible to them. So yeah, I think big box stores, let's say Crate and Barrel or Pottery Barn, <clears throat> you know, <laughs> that are making better, more couture-like pieces, they do well, help companies like us. Their, better, their art direction has just gotten better and better yes. over the years. So clients are seeing things that are aesthetically pleasing, but the quality is not there. Yeah. So yeah, the hopefully, they, there. hopefully mm-hmm. that's driving them to us, which yeah. is probably what you're talking about. Yeah, the, so. the awareness is there because the great art direction, and they see these art-directed lives and these images, and then they want that. So luckily, they find us. And the hard part is when they expect it for the same price that Restoration yeah. has it for, and yeah. it's like... That's the flip oh, side of the discussion. Oh. <laughs> you know, yeah. But I think that's, that's our responsibility as designers, is to educate uh, you know, that our clients to say, hey, you can get this, it's, it's, it'll, it looks the same, or it, it, it's going to look similar, but it's not going to last, this is what's going to go wrong, you mm-hmm. know, the switch is going to break, the leg is going to fall off, All right. but, but that's how we've made our business as well, is... is uh, because we do sell a lot of stuff on the internet now, but uh, even through our photography, how, how are you showing these details that they can't produce in, in that sort of mass, uh, mass cost, I guess. And your, your finishes are so pretty and your, your hardware is so yeah. beautiful. That, 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 that probably is something that you need to... But you, I see you always use vignettes and tight little shots to yeah. show the corners. Yeah, it's, the it's, it's definitely... That's, that's what, as a designer, that's what my focus is. Yeah. I think that's what, what sets designs apart is, is really what happens on this scale. Yeah, I'm intrigued by um, the fact that I think with good quality things available to a larger group of people, that people, my clients tend to want to go towards more a piece like yours where they probably know they'll move, but the pieces that they feel are from artisans are pieces that they can keep yeah. and they can add to their collection. And then you know maybe a sofa has to be remade in a longer fashion or a different style. But these other pieces become part of a permanent collection, which reminds me of what you were saying about, you know, it's important, I think, to kind of go to a client and realize they have their own ideas and their own collection and, and build upon that. Um, so that, that's where I think craftsmanship is probably the, the, um, the most important feature. So with that said, I mean, do you, do you think that people have a hard time spending extra money on pieces that they may not necessarily take with them? Typically, oh, on, yes, on pieces they won't necessarily take with them, absolutely. I, you know, it's hit and miss. Everyone's, everyone's different, but from our experience, yeah, they would rather spend the money on the investment pieces. I mean, that's just the bottom line. And when you're buying quality, everything we do is handmade here in Los Angeles, and it's all selected by us. It's all, you know, closely inspected. And when you get people so involved in the process and so involved in the final outcome of it, you're, it doesn't go wrong. It rarely goes wrong. Right. And when that's the case, they don't mind spending the extra money. But yeah, I mean, no one's going to go to restoration and spend $10,000 comfortably on a sofa yeah. or on a light fixture. Right. It's just not, it's not in it. Whether it comes from China or it comes from India, they'd ra- I think a lot of people who are spending you know, larger amounts of money on furniture, accessories, lighting, I think they like helping to support the local economy mm-hmm. and the local vendors because it's it's good for the it's good for everyone the country you know etc do Bernard, do people ever ask you where you get your wood or your your, your materials or raw goods we've got such a broad uh, we basically will build anything uh, we, we've got kind of the two two businesses one is strictly custom so we we're, we're making uh, you know, any, for any different kind of furniture, but metal, glass, whatever. But our, the materials we're selecting are usually driven by, by cost. So we'll be given a budget and said, hey, we're looking for something, this is our range, and so we, we try to maximize. Do you do commercial work as well, restaurants and things? Yeah, we do. We've got a couple lines that we use in restaurants, and that's uh, just a different different level of, of, of finish and whatnot, but it's based on our, our residential collections. Right. Um, I went on the topic from before. I wanted to comment that it, I think it's much more difficult to get clients to invest in pieces that they can't see a picture of, even if you're so to take something and customize it. They're comfortable with, but that's not what we do. We want every piece to be completely custom. So we're asking them to go on an artistic process with us and be patient and be part of the process, and that's harder, which is why it takes, it's taking longer for us to build our, our, our portfolio and our, our studio, really, because we're just, we're 
taking that stand that that's important to us and we're not going to just go shop for things like you know like you said right. that's, that it's, it's an interesting thing because you talk about craftsmanship in the digital age mm. we've kind of made a, 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 a business based on uh, selling these pieces that never existed before mm -hmm. but we we use renderings uh, I've you yeah. know when we talk about craftsmen I've got uh, you know, just up the block, I've got about 20 craftsmen that are digital craftsmen. These guys, they're, they're, mm. they're do, working on renderings, they're mm -hmm. working on drawings uh, uh, to communicate those, these details and things uh, in, in visual. Do they work specifically for you? They're on your staff? Yeah, or? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but, but that's how we, you know, on our uh, the commercial side, we do a lot of commercial offices. We'll, so we'll create a, a, a virtual space that it, it, it's essentially a, a, a photograph. You know, right. you really don't know the difference. But that's, that's one way we've been able to incorporate this, you know, craftsmanship in a digital age. But then we're able to take these, these, these renderings and these computer files, and I send them directly over to the machines, and the machines go and they cut it like that. So mm -hmm. th th that's like, uh, I'm, I'm not completely shunning what, what a craftsman is about it, but it, I, I feel it doesn't necessarily need to be somebody with a piece of wood behind right, a table Right, that is saw. craftsmanship. That yeah. is absolutely it's, craftsmanship. It's, 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 well, I think the next it's a, new, a yeah. new age of craftsmanship in that way. Yeah, I would say the new age of craftsmanship is definitely telling the story mm -hmm. to get people to understand it. And, and I think what I love about you know vignettes or tight images is that I think sometimes the essence of something is seen really in a smoky corner where you really mm -hmm. feel yeah. the flavor of what's happening. And um, I think that's where um, this kind of world where you can be on a phone and talk to a client and say, all right, go on the site and just send them to a site. Sometimes it's a hotel. It doesn't matter what it sure. is. You can feel the essence of what you're trying to say, which is so nice. Definitely. And how do you, what do you, how do you, how do you? Well, do you I, I just wanted to bring up more of a point again about kind of what we were supposed to be, what we're supposed to be talking about, which is in terms of like craftsmanship being a lost art, you know? And what I'm seeing that I think is interesting, because we're talking about, you know, our clients and this and that and these expensive pieces and how do we convince them to, to buy these things? What I'm seeing is even on a different level, an interest in craftsmanship. And that's even on Urban Outfitters, that they're selling, you know, that they're selling um, play, vinyl players, you know, so kids can buy <coughs> vinyl versus just a CD or downloading something on their iPhone, that they want the quality of the sound of vinyl that there are these craft, sh craft shows that are coming up, you know, that mm -hmm. have amazing, it's not just like your hokey local arts fair, these are amazing craft fairs, like what we have in Echo Park, or I know that there's one going on um, in the Hudson Valley, I think it's called uh, Field Supply or something, I think that's what it's called. These amazing craft fairs are coming up, and that's because, in general, people are wanting this craftsmanship, and it doesn't have to be, you definitely are paying more for it, no matter what level, whether it's at the craft fair or you know something that we're creating. But I just, I just think that there's definitely a yearning for do that. You, do you mean? Do you think it's the handmade, or do you think it's the unique part that people uh, are interested I in, think or both? It's the local. Mm -hmm. I think it's the craftsmanship. I think it's. Um, it can be that it's unique or artisanal, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. And I think it's quality. Mm -hmm. Do you find? Is things. it easy to find uh, people that can create what you design? Yeah, for me. I mean, I live in Los Angeles. There's amazing resources no. here, you know. No, I agree. Um, yes. Yeah, you just have to just poke around. Yeah. You know, ask it does people. take find. It take time to find. It takes the time. Great I've been doing this a long time, <laughs> and you go through people, and you're not that person's not quite right, and then you find somebody else. And that's definitely something that I bring as a designer. That's a value is my experience and my resources right. to quality, you know, craftsmen. Mm -hmm. And the craftsmen, are they, are they um, innovative? Are they excited about the old they skills or new no. skills? Or? I, have, I have one. I mean, he and I are like bouncing around. How are we going to use these 3D printers? What can we do? This is like a cool new opportunity. What can we do to create something unique? You know, I always work backwards. I work backwards from my mm -hmm. client. I work backwards from technology. I work backwards. What is, what's missing? And then I work backwards. And I create things that are missing or that I want that I can't find or that I think would be interesting based on what's available to us. Sure. Yeah, and how do you, and, and how do you plan in the future? Do you, do you, would you like to have more, con, more product, more unique sure. product? Yeah. I would love to have more time to develop product. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I would shop more if, you were making more products for me. <laughs> then that will I change. I mean, They're talking about working backwards, part of the reason yeah. why we've developed everything custom and we've always been geared more towards that is because we didn't care for what was in the marketplace. Right. That's why we've used so many vintage pieces, just not because we think it's cool, but because that's the only place to find those kind of unique shapes and materials and 
detailed products. That's precisely. But now that you all are starting to make amazing things for us, you make, yeah. make it easier. We can't just buy That's precisely things. why the idea of finding a way of searching for these people mm -hmm. was what Peter and I were talking mm -hmm. about. Because, you know, it's out there. It's great stuff. And because I live in a place like New York and you live in a place like Los mm -hmm. Angeles and because you're a designer, you actually get access to cool things because your designer friend invited you to one of his projects to mm -hmm. see it. But the, you know, people just don't have access to those kind of things. And so that was what was frustrating because I wanted to think of sort of the new as vintage, meaning yeah. that your unique content is as unique as something vintage, which mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. um, and that was hard to figure out how to do because how do you get access to it? Um, so to me, that, that's a great way to, uh, to really make craftsmanship even more important, mm -hmm. and, and to get craftsmen even even busier. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, it's hard to find enough space to build it all, which is what I was saying was so much easier in Los no Angeles way. than it is in New York. Sure. But, but, but I found it's harder to find uh, in, in some of these kind of high-end woodworking. Uh, I, I feel that Los Angeles didn't have the same level of craft as they did in New York. And in New York, we had these kind of great old world, like, you know, we were yeah. talking about like the 80-year-old 80 the, the 80 guy mm -hmm. that, you know, can put something together. We uh, had the same problem. So, so but what, what we ended up doing now is, is we're, we're, we're training people. So what we'll do is we'll take one of our old, you know, the, uh, we call them the old kind of craftsman masters, and then we'll give him two helpers. So he's, he's passing that knowledge. And so, uh, and, and I think that's the important thing, that that level of uh, or, or knowledge is, is being passed on because that's, 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 it's, it's that hard. Be, they're, they're not teaching it in schools anymore. There right. is no. there's no apprenticeships or anything like that. That would be a life. That would be the greatest thing you could leave behind. I think sure. sort of a <laughs> legacy of you know new craftsmen coming from from other people. Yeah, we experienced the same thing moving here from New York about seven years ago. The metal workers, the metal finishers, they weren't up to the same level of quality as they were over there, and we had to, with a lot of time, a lot of patience, and a decent amount of yelling get them mm -hmm. to understand how we need things to be made because it's got to be predictable, which is, I think, something yes. really important, especially when you're doing something custom. We have to, and to get back to what Bernard was saying earlier, um, working in, as craftsmen in the digital age, you know, we don't provide renderings for our clients, but we do provide AutoCAD drawings in 2D or SOLIDWORKS drawings in 3D because fortunately our engineer is capable and can do those kinds of things. So there is an interesting way that we can communicate our concepts to them as well, but it does, I do find it very helpful when you can take something, whether it's a modification or an original idea, and mm -hmm. blow it up, and then, you know, putting it in a context of an environment is great, but at least being able to see it or send them a 3D PDF file, and they can rotate it, and they can see it from all the angles. It, it, it's advantageous, because, well, some of them skip by. When you see some of the processes, some of the pieces, there'll be anywhere from five to 50 pairs of hands on any one of our light fixtures you know, from beginning to end, and everyone has to understand what they need to do in order to execute it. So it's, it's crucial that we, you know, use these tools. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about craft is that there is variety, I think, to finishes oh, yeah. and to materials. Um, uh, you know, sometimes when we, when we aren't winning our battle, we'll say, you know, patina in character. Um, <laughs> meaning that, you know, there's some variety, and that's a good thing, but that's it's right. not it's always... Natural. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's supposed to look like that. <laughs> exactly. But um, it's not a scratch. To... <laughs> it's supposed to have that crack down the middle. Exactly. But, you know, it's, 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 it's unique material, yes. too. So do you find that... One of the things I like is, is if I find a new craftsman, I tend to push a new idea that the craftsman, if they work in Chagrin, suddenly Chagrin is what I'm really into yes. today. Um, and I think that's that. kind of fun, because that is um, where I think craftsmen come in. Mm -hmm. um, they inspire you to create more things, basically, around their skills. Well, I, I love going both ways. It, and as a designer, going and pushing mm -hmm. these craftsmen as well, going to them and saying, hey, listen, I, I, I know what you've, be, what you've been doing, and I know that you're used to making this lamp this way, but you know what, if, you, if could you use this material? And it's, it's a similar process, but it, it's, it's, I, I really like that play, that balance. Uh, they come with their experience and we come with, with you know, our eye. But do you fall in love with a pile of wood that you found in some warehouse and that oh, changes? Oh, all, all the time. That, that's, that's one of my favorite things is to go look in old barns at, uh, you know, old reclaimed wood and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we, we found some amazing, we did a table not too long ago, 24 foot uh, a walnut slab that was probably four and a half feet wide and just awesome table. But the, the, the material, made the table it yeah. wasn't the table didn't exist before that material got discovered that's amazing 
There's an image of one of our pieces in there that's a similar. It's a parchment. Uh, it's a custom table that we just developed, and we use parchment. But we had seen an inspiration image of something that was vintage, and we didn't know what it was. And we just made up all these. We worked on all these different ideas for materials of what it could be. We found out from someone who recognized the table is actually glass from 70s, whatever. So we came up with parchment, but then because there were such small widths of the parchment, we ended up creating this whole pattern of angles and things based on mm -hmm. the markings on the parchment. It'll, it'll come around there in a little bit. It's amazing looking, and that was, you know, that came out of the process. Yeah, I, I always leave sort of a, an allowance on the side for a learning curve, where, you know, there's a warehouse full of um, parchment <laughs> that's um, lifted on the sides because I used the wrong guy or because mm -hmm. they didn't fold it over. And so I sort of actually like that. I, it's sort of a privilege of having a design firm yeah. is that you can make mistakes and you can kind of do it better the next time. Yeah. And we also <laughs> call things sometimes full-scale mock-ups, which yes. mean that... <laughs> it's a work in process. <laughs> well, it's actually something that was sold or built for a client. Yes. And you look at it, it's a like, prototype. It's good, yeah. but it's not perfect. And then you make adjustments and um, yeah. Someone paid for your full-scale mock-up, yes. but you know, you get a good product, and it gets better. It evolves. Mm -hmm. I often wonder if you know, like if that was true of when you look at I don't know Parzinger or whatever. If you looked at their early pieces, were they kind of, uh, you know, not his favorite pieces, and they got right. adjusted and made better? But I think that's kind of part of the art of thinking and yeah. craftsmanship process. I think that's another thing that we all we tend to do in our company. We'll edit a product if we have it in our line for a year or two and we see something we want to change, we'll improve it. We will continue to strive to improve it because we're lucky, it's our company, it's our prerogative and we'd rather allow the piece to evolve over time as well. I mean, if, if something like semi-precious stones is popular and it's something that we decided to work in but we want to change it to alabaster, something else, whatever it might be, we let this product sort of speak for itself too over time which is another advantage, just like a, you know, full-scale mock-up. Mm -hmm. Do you ever name any of your pieces after a client? <clears throat> I did. Um, I we, did. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, please. Um, we have a, a custom beer pong table that's in one of the images I put here for everyone's benefit. Um, it's definitely named after the client. <laughs> we, we would not have been designing a custom beer pong table. How do you know what that is? I, we didn't either. I'll, I'll point it out to you when it flies by the next time. It's pretty amazing looking. We styled it with champagne flute, you know, vintage champagne flutes rather than whatever people do with beer pong tables, but pretty, pretty fun. That will always be named after him for sure. Yeah, I don't think there's ever a limit to uh, other people's creative ideas yes. about how to live. It keeps you, uh, keeps you on your toes. Well, it was amazing that he let us make it look good instead of just, you know, oh, it's just a beer pong table. We're going to do whatever we do on that, and you don't need to worry about how it looks. He, he let us make it look amazing. <laughs> Interesting. I'll it's coming up. I'll show you. My, my new challenge is a, uh, almost a double king bed of oh. extra width and extra There's length. There's the parchment dining table. Right, it's it's like actually two tables that oh, pull wow. apart. That's gorgeous. They actually said that they like to have all the kids and dogs all in the morning. Oh, yeah, family bed. bed and that she never understood how these dimensions came about in the first place, which I, I oh, agree, yeah. actually. And, um, and there's certainly no challenge at all whatsoever to building it. It's just funny how we're all conditioned to uh, a few standard sizes. Absolutely. There, there's the beer pong table. I still don't know what it is. <laughs> I'm sure no. someone in here could tell us. <laughs> Joe? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> If Joe were very, very rich, I wonder what he would make his clients design. Re remember, remember, to, remember to call us. Solo cups might need a little update. Let's just say we wouldn't allow it on Deering Hall. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, questions. Please. First of all, it's a compliment, right? <laughs> and if you're de and if you're and if you're a good designer, you can always come up with lots of other ideas. But the truth is, when I'm designing pieces, I spoke to this a little bit, but I definitely try to make something that's has more. Of, if it's crafted, meaning it requires artisans to make it, they can't, they can't knock, knock it off. It off. Yeah. So a lot of our pieces are kind of inspired by that craftsmanship. 
And, and I think that that's kind of what sets some of our pieces apart, is their craftsmanship. So, but again, you know, you just, you always have to have new ideas. I think that's the whole yeah. essence of it, really. I actually have no problem with that. And I think that actually it's all about the, the details and the quality. And it looks kind of similar, but it's, there's something different. And actually, I think of fashion a lot. You know, beautifully cut clothing is very different than the pieces that have been knocked off. And we still tend to go to the good stuff if we can. Or you have your lawyer send them a cease and desist. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like that too. <laughs> yeah. As a matter of fact, and it's, it's a very rare thing that occurs, but about two weeks ago, uh, we got a phone call. Suffice it to say, there was something that was very complicated that we, f that we fabricate that was in fact knocked off uh, as a one-off thing for a private client. I called the owner of the company, and I found out that he's like, a quarter of a mile from where we were. I had a conversation with him. We saw eye to eye. You know, I told him this is not how you do business. And I was did, politely intimidating. And Did he explain he said, why really they didn't sorry. just use you? I mean, it probably wasn't any cheaper. It did was, they know? it's a long story, uh. but um, he, under, so he undervalued the product to um. his client and ended up Losing money on the prob uh, on the project, which I'm happy about. Yeah, it's the least. <laughs> because he underestimated how complicated it was what to actually did. make. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, that happens from time to time. But yeah, we've, you know, and we've also designed for a couple of other larger companies, done lighting for them, and we've had, you know, just to send cease and desist letters here and there. It usually is enough to get a company to stop or move on. And it basically, it's just, it's sad when people don't have the wherewithal to at least think a little bit differently and they just try to reproduce something that's there, there's no challenge in that. And that's why we do what we do, because we enjoy making something out of an idea, making something out of nothing, literally. And for us, that's what, you know, that's one of the things that gets us high. You know, it's sitting down with a pad and a pencil, even in this digital age, and mm -hmm. scribbling, and my wife, who's our design director, does 90 plus percent of the designing, and you know, she'll come up with pages and pages of drawings and we'll sift through it and that's the fun and that's the joy. Not looking around and going, oh wow, that's a killer mic stand, I'm gonna make one of those, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's sad, it does happen, but fortunately not very often. Please. Um, well, that's what I was talking about. I mean, it's, it's a very much a long conversation with the client about the full-scale mock-up and just right. explaining, like, this is a work in progress. We, as you know, because you just worked on a project with us that was a three-and-a-half-year project that's now installed, and some of the images are from that. Um, I just had a conversation the other day of, you know, we spent three-and-a-half years building and designing this building, and now everybody's gone except for us, and we've only had a few months to do, you know, we've been involved the whole time, but the part that we're doing now, we've really only had since the summer to begin, and we need time to develop our part as well. And sometimes it's just being in the house and moving things around and getting, being in the space and feeling what's working and then you know, being able to refine things. So, you know, he's like, we just want to be done. Yeah. So we just, we just tell them, we try to work together. You know, they, they love us, so it's fine. We make ourselves very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, craftsman takes time. Yeah. Anyone? So you mentioned um, digital renderings that you send out to your to have things made or to your clients to present. I'm wondering if you, if any of you, uh, submit hand drawings when you're presenting your ideas, and if your clients respond more favorably to those versus digital, and kind of where you see that going with your development. For us, it depends on the client. Yeah, you know, same. The, if the and client the scale of the project. Yeah, absolutely. If the client can interpret. Uh, my scratch or a great drawing that my wife can do, fantastic. If they require something more specific, it's all really up to the client and, and their level of interpretation and their need for, you know, a really specific visual presentation of something or just a conceptual, you know, quickie. I'm fascinated by that because uh, I think back in the day, renderings were more special or they were rare. 
certainly digital, digital ones were rare, right? And, um, and so people had put a lot of value into them. Now, if I have a meeting in my office and I do a sketch, an idea for somebody, they are very happy with that. They think that that's really original and that that, uh, that, so that piece. Oh, yeah, yeah they want to take it home with them. They want to take it home with them. them. Exactly. And, for the, Ooh, for you know, the and, and they want to show it to, uh, in this one case, they want to show it to their family members. Whereas when we had that idea brought all the way to the rendering and the CAD drawings, that was just technical, like sign off. That had nothing to do with, with you know, artistry in his eyes, which was yeah. intriguing because it's sort of the opposite. To me, it's a lot easier to do, and the artistry would have come in getting the guy to do the rendering. So, it's a it's a totally flip flop agree. thing. Right. I totally agree. But I also that. like um, sketches and uh, working paintings before the final painting of of a great artist of the past. Right. You know, I a love study. those studies. Study. Thank you. I like yeah. a study. Mm -hmm. Ooh, what are you going to make? Good question. I mean, that's kind of the, that's, so that's the question. What can I, you know, working backwards, what can I, and I'm not somebody who's going to want something that has too much of a hard edge modern kind of feel to it. So how can I make something that's within my aesthetic that maybe is using that technology? I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking about it. Stay yeah, that, that'll be exciting over the next yeah. few years because that's something that we, it's really hard to wrap your head around it because you can get anything. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it's, it's even different materials mm -hmm. now that, that can be uh, uh, printed, I guess. So I think we're, we're definitely... A vehicle. Yeah, we're, we're, to we're totally uh, scrambling to try to figure out what, what can we actually use it for. It's, mm -hmm. it's still super expensive, mm -hmm. so it's cost prohibitive, but uh, it, I, I think in the next uh, you know, 10 years, you're going to see a lot of printed products that are, that are individual, one-off. I think in the future, when it comes to architecture and interiors uh, particularly, I think you're going to see a lot of a lot more um, full-scale mock-ups in a room, meaning uh, architectural details, um, corners, full, fully executed corners, lighting fixtures, because of the fact that this 3D development, you know, you can you can build mock-ups and it's pretty great. I think that people want to see things in the real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much. As a busy professional designer, you know how important it is to find the right partnerships. Partnerships that allow you to specify the right products for every project. Professionals like you don't just have time to sit around and waste, right? So let me tell you about one of my partnerships. Pacific Sales is here to serve you with expert, knowledgeable, and non-commissioned professionals to help you specify the right product for all your projects, non-commissioned. That means their only incentive is your satisfaction. Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home, a Best Buy company, has just that, with over 60 years of service in Southern California. Pacific Sales is your destination for exploration, advice, and inspiration and you will find all your favorite brands, like Monogram, and their commitment to providing exceptional products, starting with materials. Monogram sources commercial-grade stainless steel on their refrigerators, unscratchable sapphire glass on their cooktop knobs, durable marine-grade bearings on their dishwasher racks. Monogram takes inspiration from the leading-edge materials used in the high-end automotive and aeronautics industry to provide you with lasting beauty and exceptional quality. The beauty is backed by the same level of attention to performance, which is why Monogram appliances are trusted and sought after by chefs all over the country. Chain-driven French oven doors that can be opened with one hand, and an industry-exclusive hearth oven that allows for all-electric indoor brick oven-style cooking without the need for external ventilation. These are just a few of the things that make Monogram so special. Pacific Sales features Monogram appliances, and Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home team is here to help you and offer their Pro Rewards program, which is a trade program unlike any you have experienced before. And here's the cherry on top, access. Access to exclusive builder trade incentives from top brands like Monogram. Visit a Pacific Sales showroom today to learn how you can unlock additional savings and benefits. Don't miss out on the opportunity to work with the best of the best. Visit Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home today and elevate your projects to new heights. Pacific Sales Kitchen and Home, where excellence meets expertise. Thank you, Stephen, Bernard, Paul, Wendy, and Delta.
Thank you, Megan and Troy from West Edge. I enjoy our conversation so much. I enjoy putting West Edge panels together for you, and I hope you enjoy this year's. It's going to be amazing. Thank you to my partner sponsors, Thermosol, Pacific Sales, TimberTech, Monogram, and Design Hardware. These partners are amazing companies, all who have made a concerted effort to support the design community. So check the show notes for links to each of them so you can see firsthand how they make your design business thrive and your projects exceed expectations. Thank you for listening, downloading, subscribing, and sharing the show with your friends and colleagues. Thank you for your emails and show uh, and guest suggestions. Please keep them coming, convo by design at outlook.com uh, and on Instagram, convo by design with an X. Until the next episode, be well and take today first. Mm-hmm.